Clyde is our biggest single wind farm. It's about 20% of our portfolio today. It could well be the biggest that we ever build. We are actually going to be producing 350 megawatts of power. And just to put that in context, that means we can power 279,000 homes. So this is a big, big wind farm. There's three reasons for Clyde being such a good place for a wind farm. First of all, it's close to the grid. It's right next to the motorway infrastructure to import turbine components and blades. And But most importantly, it's got a very good wind resource. Clyde Wind Farm is renewable energy on an epic scale. With 152 2.3 megawatt turbines, it's one of Europe's biggest wind farms. But how do you even begin a project of this size? You start a wind farm this scale by excellent planning. You have to ensure that you have the right people within the team who can plan out all the different aspects of the project. There are a number of constraints from ornithology and ecology on the site. There's some protected habitats and protected animal species. Another interesting one is archaeology. The site is littered with a lot of archaeological remains, Bronze Age and Roman, which is reasonably uncommon compared to a lot of our projects, but those are factors that had to be considered as we developed the layout for the project and, in fact, ultimately influenced the number of turbines that we could have. The site layout must be fine-tuned to make sure that each turbine can make the most of the wind. The topography is quite steep in many places and that presents some challenges to construction layout just to make sure that we can build something that is going to work for us. With the complex task of selecting the best turbine layout complete, site clearance can begin. The people who are passing the site and see um, wide areas of, of felled trees. The areas that are being taken down are non-native, very densely planted, with fairly low ecological value. And as part of the uh, habitat management plan for this site, they're being replaced with high quality moorland and heathland, which are sort of target conservation habitats. It's a very ambitious project, one of the biggest in the UK, and uh, should have very good benefits over the lifetime of the wind farm. Clyde's site extends across a huge area, around 47 square kilometers. With the imminent delivery of hundreds of large turbine components, this vast tract of land requires its own dedicated infrastructure. The scale associated with Clyde Wind Farm uh, is tremendous. We had to construct 105 kilometers of road, which necessitated uh, moving up earthworks in the volume of 6.2 million cubic metres. Trying to build a road system in sympathy with a very tight topography that Clyde has means that we on occasions need to, to engineer cuttings or embankments just to provide uh, the appropriate gradients and radii for the roads. The turbine suppliers can only deliver up to certain gradients. They bring in 60, 90 tonne components. These can't go up vertical slopes. They cannot go around tight corners. Alongside the network of new roads, Clyde's team put other parts of the puzzle in place, installing 142 kilometers of cabling and constructing two substations and an operations building. While preparations are made on the ground, attention also turns to the skies. It was identified early in the development phase that there would be an impact on the lo local primary radar station adjacent to Clyde Wind Farm from the turbines. The turbine blades have a similar effect on air traffic controllers' screens as an aircraft does. So what we have to do is remove the wind turbines by cutting out the airspace from one radar and infilling it from another radar. The Cumbernauld primary radar will not only assist SSE in developing new wind farm sites across the central belt of Scotland, but will also assist potentially other developers in their wind farm portfolio and ultimately help towards the government's renewables obligations. Back on the ground, the foundations of the new wind farm are laid. To allow a turbine to be erected, you have to prepare the ground, you have to install the foundation, and you have to ensure that the ground conditions are sufficient, they are firm enough to place the concrete, quite a large volume of concrete, in addition to that steelwork, 
And once all that's placed, you backfill it, you place an earthing mat around it, and once it's all complete with a hard standing area for the crane to lay down on, then you can uh, physically start the erection process. Once the civil contractor has completed the foundation and the hard stands, ourselves, the crane company and the transport company come to inspect the foundation. We inspect the hard stand area to make sure it's of sufficient size and it's correct to the uh, design drawings. Once we're happy with that, we then take acceptance of the hard stands, take it over, it becomes our area. The smaller crane actually builds the bigger crane, then assists the, the large crane to erect the turbine. The whole process is, is quite quick. Um, with the tower sections, it can be as quick as an hour for each tower section, an hour and a half for the nacelle, and then the rotor assembly itself takes around about four hours to, to put together and about an hour to fly. So in a day with perfect conditions and with no problems, you can build a turbine. When we're erecting the tower, the large crane will lift one end and the smaller crane will lift the other end and we call it what you call a tandem lift, we lift it up and then once it's clear of the ground, the large crane then proceeds to lift and the smaller crane starts to lower off to, to release its weight until we have the, the tower section vertical. Then we release the small crane from the section, move the section into position, land it into position, and then we just continue with that with the other two tower sections. From that stage, the nacelle, which houses the gearbox and the uh, generator, we then lift that into position but we have to make sure that the weather conditions are good for that because the nacelle actually weighs 87 tonnes. So we have to have pretty perfect conditions for that. With the nacelle firmly fixed on top of its tower, the most challenging stage of a turbine build arrives. The blades that will harvest the wind must be fitted to the rotor. The rotor assembly is the largest item that we lift. We assemble the blades into the rotor with the rotor lying on its back on the elephant's foot. It covers a wide span, you have 45 meter long blades and we can leave it left in that position so long as we tie the blades down. Maximum lift and wind speed is gusting to 9 meters a second. If we're in that parameter we have to decide to maybe not lift above a mid-tower section. We look at weather forecasts on a very regular basis. We also have to pick up the wind speeds from the crane anemometer. The crane anemometer is sat at the very top of the boom of the crane and that dictates how the, the crane driver will operate. Lifting this giant structure into place is a highly skilled and potentially dangerous manoeuvre. When you've been working on a wind farm for a, for a length of period of time, you get to know the wind patterns and you can pick a wind pattern where you know that you're definitely going to get this rotor up. If there's any doubt at all that you think that the wind is going to get up too high for it to lift the rotor, then you don't lift it, it stays on the ground. You've got 60 tonnes nearly of, of weight there and it's designed to actually catch the wind. That's the, the design of the blades and to lift it in any kind of adverse weather condition is extremely dangerous. Once you pick up the rotor assembly, that's it. It's got to be assembled. It's impossible to fit the blade clamp back on a blade with the tailing crane to drop the assembly down again. The ideal world is, is that we have no wind or five meters a second, but we're on top of a big hillside in Scotland. We'll always have wind. Once the rotor's actually flown, it takes 45 minutes to take it up to the top and all the time it's governed by the crane management, guide ropes and a crew at the bottom which uh, is in contact all the time with the crew at the top who then manage the actual meeting of the, the turbine blades with the actual nacelle. It's so accurate it's done to millimetres. Once it gets closer, the wind has less effect on it because it's closer to the actual crane and closer to the nacelle. The biggest part is lifting from the base to the top. People misunderstand the time frame for building turbines. Sometimes we can get up to a nacelle level, the rotor is assembled and we're waiting a week 
for the weather to calm down enough to be able to pick that rotor assembly up. Now, safety is paramount to the success of the project, so you know we won't we won't only risk uh, the safety of any individual on the site um, just because we can get maybe you know a turbine up early um, with you know based on the fractions of wind, you know. So we would rather deliver the project safely than have an issue with um, somebody's life. As part of the commissioning process, each completed turbine is put through rigorous testing before it can start supplying the grid with clean, green electricity. Each turbine has a weather station in the rear of the nacelle, uh, which dictates where the turbine points. Uh, the blades then catch the wind uh, that's coming towards it. Uh, this motion goes through a gearbox uh, onto a high-speed shaft, which then goes into a generator. It's that generator that creates the power. Uh, that power is transferred down the tower and out of the turbine into the package substation and onto the main circuit of the wind farm. In the late summer of 2012, just over four years after its planning consent was granted, Clyde Wind Farm is fully operational and ready for official approval. With enormous anticipation and great delight, I hereby declare this mighty wind farm of Clyde well and truly open. Renewable energy now supplies well over a third of Scotland's electricity demand. That's rising very quickly. We're one of the leading countries in the world now in terms of uh, renewable energy. Yeah, but also this generates lots of jobs, I mean 600 jobs in the construction phase, 60 long-term jobs. The, the wind towers, these massive structures, they're, they're made in Makrahanish uh, in Argyll, sustaining the, the factory there. All of that, plus enough power to power every home in the city of Glasgow. Not bad. Today's a culmination of, of 10 years of hard work by up to 8,000 people. There's a sense of pride. Uh, the great achievement that the SSE team have done in developing and building this project. The professionalism and skill of the team is amazing and as a humble accountant I'm uh, amazed at the scale of the operation, the, the challenges and the engineering and craft skills that have been deployed here. The team and the workers involved in the Construction Wind Farm uh, have been tremendous. I've got the utmost respect for them. Uh, the varying uh, weather conditions, the difficulties associated with the uh, various elements and interfaces in the construction has, has proven to be uh, a huge challenge and they have all overcome it. I think there will be a long term legacy here. Uh, these turbines will be here for at least 25 years. During that period we're going to be putting about £20 million into local communities. So Dumfries and Galloway Council, the Borders Council and South Lanarkshire Council the people in that, those areas will all benefit from uh, the legacy that we leave behind here. Having seen the development site from the arrival of the diggers and the arrival of all the construction staff to actually come in and seeing the completion, it's a great moment and it's a great moment to see so many people from Scotland having contributed to the, to the success of the project.